Um, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, growth versus efficiency and, and how to weatherproof your startup for, for tougher times. Um, but a really, really quick intro about what we're doing at Point9. We're an early stage venture capital firm. Uh, we've been around for about 12 years. We focus on SaaS investments at the very earliest stages, and we invest in startups from uh, pretty much all over uh, the globe, uh, mostly in Europe, but also in the US, Canada, and other countries. So we're a very uh, geo-agnostic, and if you haven't heard about Point9 yet, you've probably heard about some of the companies that we've been an early investor in, such as Algolia, uh, Chart Module, Incident.io, Loom, Typeform, Zendesk, and, and many others. So the topic that we like, what I, that I like to talk about today is uh, growth versus efficiency um, in these tougher times. And I'm, I'm sure you had a, you heard a lot of talk about this or, or already. A lot of uh, VC ad uh, advice on, on Twitter and elsewhere. I, I hope you're not sick and tired of uh, talking about this yet. Um, but I'll try to avoid the very generic uh, advice like everybody needs five years of, of runway because I think it's great if you can have five years of runway, if you can be default alive, but it just doesn't work for every company. And so I'll try to uh, take a closer look at the balance between growth and efficiency, um, and uh, we'll, we'll dig into that. So a few months ago, I wrote a blog post titled, Hypergrowth is great, but don't die while trying. I'd like to start by quickly walking you through the key concepts of that blog post. I, I try to do it as fast as possible because you can uh, look that up online. And after that, I'll talk a bit about what investors are looking for in 2022 based on some surveys that we did and some other benchmarks. Um, then I'll dig into some metrics that you can use to measure growth and efficiency. And then there will also be some time for, for Q&A. All right, let's go. Um, a question for you all. Who of you has been in a situation where things were going well, you were growing fast, you were crushing it, you were getting calls from Tiger, your VCs probably told you that you should burn money faster, and then just a few months later, things look drastically different, drastically worse. Um, your growth rate has tanked, your runway got very short, you started to get nervous about the, the next financing round. Does that sound familiar to, everybody, to, to, to somebody here? Put your hands up. Oh, awesome. It's awesome to see some honest people in the room. Um, let's try to dig in a bit deeper here to sort of unpack how that, un, how that can happen and ideally how you can uh, try to avoid that next time. So how come companies can go from boom to bust sometimes in a matter of months? That's the, that's the question. So if you suddenly find yourself in a much worse situation, it's probably because two things happened. Number one, your growth rate went down, and number two, you kept spending cash according to your original plan. So this is what typically happens, or at least one of the reasons that can uh, lead to like shit basically hitting the fan. And if we try to understand this formula a little bit better, slow growth plus high spend um, leads to higher burn, shorter runway, you have less ARR, uh, less investor interest, so you have to raise your next round earlier. Um, you have to do it with a lower level of ARR. You have to uh, do it with, with less growth. So that's a pretty bad formula. And in a red hot VC market, like the one that we had until last year, um, you can probably get away with this. But in a much, much tougher market like the one that we entered this year, this is a, a formula for disaster. In the best case, you'll raise at a much lower valuation than you expected. And in the worst case, you might literally go bust. So 
let's try to dig in a bit deeper into the metrics of an Im uh, uh, imaginary SaaS company to get a better understanding for how this formula can, can work out. Um, and again, I'll run through this pretty quickly uh, because you can also look this up um, online if you want to look at all the, all the numbers. So what you can see here on the screen is the ARR projection of, of ACME. Um, of course, it's called ACME. Um, and uh, ACME is at $4 million in ARR. The company has raised $12 million, wants to use that to triple ARR to $12 million in 12 months and then grow to another, uh, grow another $7 million to $19 million, to 19 million in ARR in another six months. Um, you can see the ARR projection here and here you can see the projection for incoming cash, the green bars, outgoing cash, the, the red bars and then the, the red line indicates the net burn and then here on the top right you can see what that means for the bank balance and according to uh, ACME's planning they are in a pretty comfortable situation, have an ambitious plan but 18 months of runway so that's looking pretty good. Now let's fast forward um, six months and see how ACME has been doing. So the company has grown in those six months from 4 million in ARR to 6.2 million, which is pretty awesome. It's not quite as fast as expected, but um, definitely um, pretty respectable growth. Um, you can see that there is a tiny little difference between the plan numbers and the, and the actuals, um, but it's, it's not a big difference. Um, here are the updated uh, cash, uh, cash charts and the uh, updated bank balance, so it, it all look, looks pretty good. Um, but nevertheless, the, the founders, uh, the management team of ACME is smart, so they take a closer look and decide that they should do a, a, a reforecast based on the slightly uh, lower growth. So um, the company has had projected to grow 9.6% month over month, which corresponds with a 3x growth ambition that I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, but they actually grew only 7% month over month. Um, so they do a new uh, forecast uh, based on that. Uh, you can see the dotted line here, um, and uh, you can see here what it means to the cash flow projections and ultimately to the bank balance. And what you can see here is that if the company keep spending according to the original plan, um, but uh, keeps, reven keeps growing revenue as per the trend of the last six months, it'll run out of money in seven months. So it's pretty dramatic. What? The company started with 18 months of runway. Six months later, Acme has only seven months of runway left. What happened there? So there is a very simple answer to this and it's the company was burning too much, it didn't have enough buffer. That's all very true, but nevertheless, let's dig in a bit deeper to see what maybe the, the founders could have done to detect that even earlier. One of the issues, and it's, I don't know if it's too obvious to, uh, to even mention it, but it's, there have definitely, um, I've definitely seen uh, people uh, get this wrong, is that if you look at the total ARR figures and compare the actuals to the plan, the, the difference uh, is not that, that visible. You can see here um, on, on these charts here, if you look at the difference between the dark, darker green and lighter green bars which show like the, the targets and the actuals. There is a small difference but it definitely doesn't look dramatic. But if you then plot a chart for net new ARR, which is like the net new that you keep adding uh, every month, um, it's a much, much more visible difference. It's, it's the same underlying numbers but depending on which of these metrics you're looking at, it becomes much easier to spot that difference. And another way of looking at it is, is this. Again, it's the same numbers, the numbers from the charts on the previous slides. 
and here it shows the goal achievement percentage. And if you look at ARR, all of these goal achievement percentages are 90%, 95%, 100%. So you could easily fool yourself into thinking that you're hitting your plan and that everything is in the green zone. But if you look at the net new ARR, goal achievement percentage, you can actually see that you're at much lower value, 60%, 70%, 80%. And so with that simple trick of making sure that you always keep a very close eye on net new ARR, you might be able to detect, or you will be able to detect uh, significant deviations from that plan much earlier. Now I hope you are all focused on the right metrics and adjust to changes quickly. Um, but let's also talk about uh, the, the, the case when things aren't going that well. So when you're kind of a bit, a bit too close to, to, to that iceberg um, and, uh, and, and try to uh, navigate a, a, a tougher situation. So as I said in the very beginning, I think there is no one size fits, uh, fits all answer. Um, if you're planning to be default alive, which is a, is a, which is a great goal, it, it might, depending on your situation, lead you to underinvest in, in product and R&D, sales and marketing. So the consequence of that might be that you, um, that you sort of, you don't fail quickly, but you also don't, don't succeed. So um, it's, it's really important to uh, look at the, at the very specifics to uh, determine what you could do to increase your runway if you want to increase your runway or if you think you have to increase your runway. Um, um, I think there is a great concept which was recently uh, popularized or coined by David Sachs, the, the founder of, of Yammer and other companies and investor at Craft Ventures, and he calls it default investable. And then what that means is that you should always be in a situation where you are not necessarily default alive. Um, you, you, you probably need a, another round of funding, but you have high conviction that by the time you are at the end of your runway, you are in a good position to be raising. So you think about like, where am I going to be in nine months, for example, if you have, let's say, 12 months of runway, and you think about like, what is my most likely uh, uh, situation going to be, and is that aligned with what investors are looking for in this current market? Um, so let's talk about what makes a company investable, and this is actually a question that we've been looking into for, for a number of years, and then we always try to uh, capture a lot of data and investor sentiment and all bring this on our uh, SaaS funding napkin, which actually exists in physical form. You might uh, find some of them lying around here at, at this conference. Um, investors look at a lot of different things, various kind of metrics, growth, logo churn, revenue churn, net expansion, efficiency metrics, and then many other things. And they obviously also look at a lot of more qualitative factors like your team, your product, the competitive situation. Um, and again, like we try to uh, capture all these things on, on that napkin. Investors always had and probably will always will have very high growth expectations. Um, what you can see here are some numbers from Bessemer Venture Partners, very large data set of uh, cloud portfolio companies. Um, this is data probably going back at least 10 years. And what you can see here is that the, the average company in Bessemer's cloud portfolio has been growing about 3x between one and 10 million in ARR, and still round about 2x or even more than 2x above 10 million ARR. So that's a pretty, pretty high bar, I would say. And these numbers are not necessarily a snapshot of the current market. It's, these are uh, benchmarks collected over, over many years. Um, but it actually hasn't changed that much, at least based on everything we were able to find out by talking to a lot of investors and having 100 or so, or maybe 80 investors participate in our SaaS funding uh, survey earlier this year. Um, the, the, the takeaway for us was 
jobs that at the Series A to get investors excited, you, you still need to grow two to three X, um, probably still the same at the Series B. Maybe there are some exceptions, um, but it, it, generally I would say that the growth expectations, they, they remain very, very high. Um, in that survey that I've mentioned, we also asked investors specifically what matters in 2022 um, and ask them to uh, tell us what matters more, what matters less, where do they see no differences um, across a couple of different uh, categories or aspects. And as you can see here, only 11% of the investors that participated in that survey said that revenue growth is less important in 2022. 26% even said that it's more important in 2022, and, and the rest of them said that it doesn't, uh, there isn't really no difference to, to previous years. What's new, though, is that there is a very, very strong new focus on efficiency. Um, in, in the last years, and especially in 2020 and 2021, there's been so much money in the market driven by like macroeconomic factors and probably a lot of things that you already know and others have already talked about, um, that investors were quite happy to fund growth at pretty much any cost. Um, this has definitely changed, and um, it's also visible in, in that survey that we did here. Um, more than 80% of the investors from that survey said that efficiency, capital efficiency, is more important in 2022 than in previous years. Um, the rest said no difference, and there was nobody who said that it's less important. So you might be looking at this and thinking, wait, investors want the same or even more growth with less capital? And if you think that somehow sounds a bit like a Dilbert comic, it's because there actually is a Dilbert comic um, saying where the guy says we have to learn to do more with less. Um, it's probably the reality of a financing landscape where, they are, where the cost of capital have increased. Uh, investors can be more, more picky and uh, trying to achieve more with less is probably um, what, what many founders have to achieve uh, in, in these days. When it comes to measuring efficiency in SaaS, there are two metrics that I think are particularly important. Excuse me. Um, one is the burn multiple, um, which you might have heard about and which I'll talk about a bit, and the other is the CAC payback, CAC payback period. The burn multiple basically tells you how much capital do I burn, how much do I have to raise in order to add one dollar of net new ARR. It's a very simple formula that helps you measure the capital efficiency of the entire company in a very holistic way. As a rule of thumb, for earlier stage companies, um, below 25 million ARR, um, it's probably not, not fair to still call them early, like let's say early and mid-stage company at uh, less than 25 million ARR, uh, 1 to 1.5 is generally considered to be good or very good, and, and lower than 1 is, is great, and I'm, I'm going to show some more detailed uh, benchmarks on that in, in a second. It's important to keep in mind that in the very early days, it's, total, it's totally normal for that multiple to be higher, because in the beginning, you of course have to invest in team building, R&D, um, you have a lot of upfront costs, and you're not bringing in so much revenue. So the denominator in that formula is obviously very small in the beginning, so it's, it's very natural that companies have a higher burn multiple um, early on. And it's also okay, at least in my view, for the burn multiple to be higher at certain times, like when you've just raised a lot of uh, money and you have a lot of runway and you invest, and obviously it means that you have to um, uh, like, uh, have invest ahead of time and ahead of revenue coming in. So for there are periods in, in the life of a company where your burn multiple will probably um, go up, um, but it's important that you have, to have it under control because by the time you have to raise again, this is one of the things 
that investors will look at very carefully because if you ask somebody to invest 20, 30, 40, 50 million into your company, they will try to understand what is it that, this, what, that the company will achieve with that money. Just to, to share a couple of um, benchmarks here, um, here the, this data set ca comes from um, Andreessen Horowitz, and you can see uh, the typical numbers that they can see here uh, in, the, in their portfolio uh, for different revenue bands, and as you can see, the, the, the median for them in the zero to 10 million ARR range is 1.6, uh, and then it goes down as you, as you get bigger. Um, but you can also see that there is quite a big uh, variance between the top quartile, meaning the most efficient companies in their portfolio, and the, and the median and the bottom quartile. There are some interesting uh, benchmarks from uh, scale venture partners uh, who broke this down uh, in a more granular way. So you can see what a typical burn multiple looks like for a company below a million in ARR, one to 2.5, and, and so on. And, and again, like what's, what's very clear and it's also quite logical is that you, you start off with a pretty high burn multiple and, and then you have to make sure that, you, that it goes down over time. You might be wondering why does it actually matter? Like why do these benchmarks from other companies, like why does it matter? Like why is it actually irrelevant for, for me and for my situation? And uh, to maybe answer that question, I, uh, I did a simple calculation where I uh, showed like the evolution of the cap table for two companies, um, imaginary companies obviously, uh, based on a couple of assumptions and it's probably a bit too small to, for you to read. I can share the slides later on if anybody is interested in. Um, the, the takeaway here is that if there are two companies growing from zero to about 100 million in ARR, one of them has a burn multiple of four, the other one has a burn multiple initially starting at about three and then decreasing increasing to uh, about 0.75, then just because you have to raise so much more capital if you're inefficient, the founders end up with approximately two times the equity in the company compared to the less efficient company. And this is just based on like, the fact that you have to raise more capital. It doesn't even factor in the, the fact that if you are less capital efficient, you probably won't get that high valuation and maybe you're not even able to, to raise at all. So um, it's, uh, it, this might, I don't know, maybe explain more from a, a first principles uh, kind of thinking way to why, why this matters. It's not just like because others in the market um, do this. There is, there is a fundamental reason why capital efficiency is, is, is important. Now moving on to CAC payback period, which is the, the other um, equally important uh, capital efficiency metric that I mentioned and would like to explain a little bit more. What the CAC payback period tells you very simply is how long does it take to earn back my sales and marketing spending. If I invest a dollar in sales and marketing, how long does it take until that has flown back in gross margin to my bank account? Um, it measures sales and marketing efficiency specifically, so it doesn't replace the burn multiple, which takes into account the entire spending of the company. It's much more focused on the efficiency of your sales and marketing um, operation. Um, as a rule of thumb, if you're selling to enterprises, uh, you have a long customer lifetime, you might have a net dollar retention rate or NDR of 100% or maybe even more. 15 to 18 uh, months of payback is probably okay, probably quite good. Um, you might even uh, want to accept more than that depending on your funding and uh, depending on like how big your NDR is. There are companies with 120, 130, maybe even 140% in net dollar retention. And if you're in that lucky situation, then um, it makes sense to spend a lot on, on each and every customer. Um, if you're targeting SMBs, you will likely have higher churn. And in these cases, you should aim for something closer to 
12 months or less. But it obviously it depends, so these are just some, uh, some rules of thumb. Now, when you take a closer look at what CAC payback actually means, it starts to become a bit complicated because there are various definitions and various ways to look at, at custom acquisition costs. I think it's important that when you talk about CAC with your team or with your investors or new investors, you make sure that um, everybody talks about the same thing when they use that term because there are various ways of uh, calculating that, that metric and they are not right or wrong, they just mean different things. Um, for example, you can look at it in a blended way which uh, uh, takes into account all of your customers or you can look at paid only where you exclude um, the customers that you get from organic sources or inbound word of mouth and so on. Um, I generally think that the paid only way of looking at it is more useful because it tells you like what you really want to know usually, which is like if I add another dollar or another million of dollars, how many customers will I get? So that's usually um, the more interesting and rele relevant question, although it, it can become tricky um, when the attribution isn't so clear. So that's, a, but that's a, probably a topic for another day. Um, uh, another uh, way how you can look at CAC in, in payback in different ways is that you can include your entire sales and marketing spend and if you're at a certain scale, this is what you should do. But if you're early stage and you do a lot of marketing experiments and maybe 80% of your AEs are not yet ramped, then you may want to exclude some of these one-time costs or temporary costs or experimental things and try to figure out what's the CAC at scale or in a, in a steady state. I think that's pretty, a pretty useful way of looking at it if you think about the future. It, it's also a bit risky because you make some assumptions uh, which may or may not be true. Um, and, and lastly, uh, another, uh, another two ways how you can look at CAC in different ways is that you can take the accounting lens which uh, tells you something about the profitability of your custom acquisition, again, more at scale, but you can also take the cash-based view, and that might be very different, and it might be more relevant if you have limited runway and you're wondering what kind of sales and marketing investments can I actually afford. So when you look at it in cash terms, you have to think about, I hire this AE and I might have recruiting costs and then it might take three months for him or her to be rammed and then it might take another couple of months to be, uh, to, for them to bring in significant revenue and then you have to think about like how long does it take to collect that revenue which depends on your billing cycles and all these things. So the cash based view might be quite different from the accounting based one. Um, now the last thing I want to talk about before we hopefully still have a little bit of time for, for questions is this, uh, this two times two matrix. If you put CAC payback period and burn multiple on this two times two matrix, I think you can uh, draw some interesting conclusions, especially if you are in a situation where you need more runway and you have to think about where do I cut. Um, if you are in this top left part of the, of the chart, you have a good burn multiple, but poor sales efficiency. So obviously, I guess, if you are in that situation and you need to find some places to cut, you, you should consider cutting your sales and marketing spend because sales and marketing doesn't seem to be very efficient. Um, and actually, even if you have enough runway, um, I would consider cutting back on your S&M spend in this situation or at least not adding to it because if the sales and marketing and engine isn't really working well, it probably doesn't make sense to put in more gas into that tank until you, you manage to make it more efficient. If your 
in the opposite corner, it's the opposite. Um, you have a great sales efficiency, but a high burn multiple. So if you're in that situation and you need more runway, it's probably a big mistake to cut your sales and marketing costs because the payback is so quick that it might actually decrease your runway uh, if, you, if you don't spend on sales and marketing. So if you're in, on, on that part of the chart and you have little runway and you want to increase that, you should try to find ways to reduce costs in other areas that R&D and DNA most likely. Now if you're in that part of the, uh, in that uh, left and bottom quadrant on, in that matrix, it means you have a high burn multiple, low sales efficiency, not a great spot to be, to be in, to be honest. Um, it can be okay temporarily to be in that um, in that situation when you've just raised a round and you just have a lot of upfront costs and front-loaded costs. Um, but as I've mentioned before, this can't be a permanent situation. Um, if you uh, are getting towards the end of your runway and you have to raise again, you'll, you, you have to try to move towards the, the green areas uh, in that matrix in order to be a, a better or more easily fundable company. Um, if you're in the top right corner, congratulations. So really quickly, the, the takeaways. You can have an ambitious upside case, but I think you have to be really careful when it comes to planning your, your budget and your runway. If you project exponential revenue growth and spend money based on that, that's super risky. As I showed in the very beginning, if the growth just happens to be a little bit slower than you expected because of this compounding effect of exponential growth, there might be a pretty big gap pretty, pretty quickly. Um, what you uh, should do is keep a close eye on net new ARR, be super fast to adapt, and consider having a burn budget. I think that's a term that I've learned from Jason, Jason Lemkin, um, which I like a lot, and, and what it means is that you set a, a certain dollar amount that you and your team can burn in for each given month, and you basically you just you, ju you just don't over, you just don't exceed that. Uh, so instead of uh, you kind of make sure that you don't spend ahead of revenue, but you only increase your spending when revenue actually comes in, and that kind of ensures that that you live long enough. Uh, takeaway number three here: um, if you have enough cash. Uh, it's okay to have a higher burn multiple um, for a few quarters, but you have to watch your steady state custom acquisition costs. Um, if they aren't good, don't pile in more cash. First, like build or fix the engine before you add more gas into it, and then make sure that you are investable again by the time you have to raise again. So remember this default investable concept uh, from David Sachs. Um, Number four, depending on your burn multiple and your sales efficiency, you may want to move budget from GNA and R&D to sales and marketing, or the other way around, or reduce costs across the board if you need more runway. Um, it, it really depends on, on where you are. And the, the final takeaway here is that if runway is tight, cash really is king. So you have to think about how long does it take for a new AE that you might consider to hire to pay back his or her costs in cash in the bank. And it might be very different from what you have in your spreadsheet. Thank you very much for listening and I think we still have 10 minutes or so for Q&A. So this is this is all great for a post product market fit company like you know is in like series A, series B, and trying to grow. Um, what would be your recommendation for a pre product market fit, more like in in seed stage, especially in this market, compared to like you know last year? Yeah, I think for pre product market fit companies, I would say it's always been true that you should have a pretty small team um, because it's unpredictable how long it's going to take 
to get to product market fit, and adding more people doesn't necessarily get you there faster, right? Um, you probably want to build the most effective, most efficient engineering team, which I don't know, maybe it's five to 10 people, but definitely not 20 or 30, because you just need time. Uh, it might take you a year or three years to get the product market fit, and you just want to make sure that you survive long enough. And I would, I would have said this a year ago and two years ago, but now it's probably even more, more important because it might be even harder to raise more money in the current environment if you don't have pretty strong signs of product market fit. And how much runway would you recommend for a, for a pre-product market fit company um, to aim for? I guess it depends on the type of product and the R&D that is required, right? Like there are maybe some, uh, like some ideas where you have an MVP in, in three months and then maybe 12 months is, is fine, but if it's a technically more challenging project and it might take two years just to build a prototype, you'll need much more. Um, so, but I would say the more the better, right? Because be, getting from nothing to product market fit, in my experience, it's, it's really unpredictable because you, it's kind of like inventing something and this is by definition something new, otherwise it wouldn't be an invention. So I, I think the more time you can, uh, you can get, give yourself, the better. Makes sense, thank you. Yeah. All right, um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, if not, here are a couple of bonus tips to increase runway if things are really tight. Um, I'm not gonna read all of them to you, but I think you'll find the slides um, online or you'll maybe find it on YouTube or you can email me at uh, Christoph at point9.com. You'll also find me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn. So um, if you'd like to dig in deeper into any of this or would like to get the slides, just, just let me know. Um, thanks again for uh, coming here and for your attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.